the gold rush, Hello, Mr. Crockett. railroads, and a sense of adventure. Historians in Hollywood like to use these stories often for origins of the Wild West. But the contribution of these factors was only limited to drawing people to the frontier. The Wild West didn't become the West until women arrived. And no, we're not talking about wives and mothers of the early settlers of the West. We're talking about the madams, the ladies of the lines, and the white doves who used the world's oldest profession to civilize the Wild West. Welcome to Nutty History. And today, let's find out the filthy truth behind the brothels of the Wild West. Before women arrived at the frontier, the Wild West was the Sad West, as the towns back in the day were not exactly towns. They were just settlements with tents and holes, some holes to sleep in, some holes to do their morning business in, and lastly, some holes for men to die in. These towns were in fact simple work camps with no sense of domestic life whatsoever. These were the 1800s, and gender rules were quite strict. So without women, domestic life was a distant dream for these men. In fact, the situation was so dire that men would often take turns to cross-dress and comfort each other, or spend a fortune just to get their hands on women's knickers or see a feminine ankle. Oh, I, she was almost finished. I saw her ankles. When women arrived in the West, they saw a lot of desperate men, and they saw a clear financial opportunity. There was no society yet in the Wild West to judge these women, and they knew the demand for love in the frontier was high, and supply simply didn't exist unless they provided it. Now, during the 1800s, job opportunities for women were extremely scarce. Those who dared to venture this far out were relegated to roles like school teachers, who would be paid a measly $8 a year. And that was a high end of paying jobs. Other opportunities were being laundresses, clerks, and factory workers. Being a brothel worker not only allowed them to be independent, but a majority of women in this trade made more money than their customers, that is, men. Once the sheets began selling on Wild West streets, the influx of women turned the barren but testosterone-heavy camps into bustling, fertile towns. Soon, the women got wealthy with all the money from desperate cowboys and they used it to create a market structure. Madams of the Wild West often owned general stores, schools, and infirmaries and even provided money to build churches so men could go and repent about spending time with Madam's girls in the saloon. With all these buildings cropping up, Wild West cities and towns were born. Madam's had land, money, and of course power, but a lot of them used it to get orphans and poor kids into schools, offer help during the Civil War, and provide shelter during natural calamities. In fact, it was the influence of the saloon girls that Wyoming became the first territory to offer women the right to vote in 1869. Now, don't forget the suffrage movement didn't begin in the rest of America until 1920. Of course, the Wyoming suffrage law of 1869 was too vulgar for the rest of America. But Wyoming threatened to secede from the Union if men of Washington, D.C. couldn't bear the image of women voting. With a hurt male ego, Uncle Sam rescinded their demand for abolishing the suffrage law. Because of the brothels of the Wild West, the idea of an equality state spread, and the next eight states to pass suffrage laws were all from the West. The office of soil doves in the Wild West could vary between the saloon, a dance hall, a crib, a fancy parlor house, or even the street. These saloons had humble beginnings in the Wild West. The wagons these women arrived in as passengers had to do until buildings began cropping up. Due to the political power held by madams, white doves had full legitimacy regarding the explicit nature of their work, and they had protection working right under the noses of the authorities in both incorporated and unincorporated territories. However, the towns were small, and humans, well, they have a tendency to populate quite rapidly. There would be nights when these saloons and parlors would have more customers than the number of beds. The ladies of the line may have protection from the law, but that protection was often limited to permission to work as a ceiling expert. Now that's not us making a humorous pun at the expense of these women. That was actually a professional term used by their customers back then. Aggression against these working girls was quite rampant in the West. First of all, the laws were rather ineffective to protect a woman's dignity, especially if they were in the business of being a parlor girl. 
Most of the time, women hesitated or shied away from reporting non-consensual incidents because they knew the police would not take their report seriously and, due to the report, the word of their tragedy would become the gossip of the town. Fear of death was also a hazard on the job. Men sometimes became possessive over women or demanded more than they should. As a madam, it was necessary to have the skill of breaking out a brawl or defending your girls from dangerous men. Madam Belgian Jenny passed due to her ex-lover who showed no mercy even after she was already wounded. Now, don't think these women were safe with men who were polite and generous customers. In fact, there was a more silent and dangerous peril that threatened these working women of saloons and parlors, venereal diseases. Back in the 1800s, venereal diseases were widespread and treatments for such ailments were as dangerous as these diseases themselves. In the business of being a parlor or saloon girl, these women were constantly vulnerable because, you know, penicillin wasn't even invented yet. So for a madam, it was of utmost importance that their girls stay healthy and well. A single rumor could damage the reputation of their fine establishment. Many madams would encourage their facility to have monthly doctor visits and checkups to make sure they were free from diseases. They would also make sure that girls would maintain good hygiene and eat two proper meals every day so that they wouldn't appear sickly in any manner. Rubber was invented during the Wild West era and was available in the West but was very expensive and so were the early versions of the diaphragm. By some estimates, 20% of these workers became pregnant at some point in their careers. Pregnancies were common in the life of a saloon girl and mostly unwanted. It was bad for their life and it was bad for the business. However, avoiding pregnancies was a headache too. An archaeological dig of an early Wild West era brothel site has revealed syringes used to inject mercury, arsenic, and vinegar into the body to avoid pregnancies or treat venereal diseases. All those things are bad for the human body. The Comstock Act of 1873 made things worse for the working ladies of the West. It forced them to rely on homemade remedies, which often didn't produce desired results. The substances they were forced to ingest to avoid unwanted pregnancies contain toxic ingredients, often from plant sources. The true number of infants produced by working girls in the Old West will never be known. Now, at least some ladies, usually madams, were able to retire. The most famous of them all is, of course, Sally Stanford, who turned to politics after retirement, and though it took her five attempts, Sally won the election to the city council of Sausalito. Later, she was also elected mayor of the same town. When asked why she ran the fifth time, she replied with a smirk, We sinners never give up. Thanks for watching the nutty history of brothels in the Wild West. We hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.